since we're all here as people who were involved with the news and still care a lot about the news, I thought we might start with some topical and in the headlines kinds of areas just to you know, see, see how you're reading those, those issues. Um, your coverage in the last three years of Syria uh, and Iraq helped me and many others in this room, many others who were your readers, understand better those complex and violent situations. Um, I wanted to ask you now about another one that is a preoccupation for, I think, all of us, which is North Korea. Um, and every day there's something, and I'm sort of wondering what goes through your mind right now as to the next questions that have to be asked, the next questions that have to be figured out. Well, thank you, Tim. I just wanted to start out and, and congratulate all the fellows and to say what a terrific program the, the Friendly Program is. We, ha we didn't have anyone at the Post this year, but we've had many, many in, in the past. And um, not only do I hope that they actually take something away from it, but they're actually enormously helpful to us because they bring in a different perspective into the newsroom. And they're also there at a time when other people are on vacation. And so they, <laughs> and so they can, uh, there's lots of work to do. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I thank you for the kind introduction, Frank, um, and putting me in the line with Thomas Jefferson and Al Friendly. <laughs> thank you. Um, North Korea, um, you know, it, it sort of comes and goes over the years. I can remember because as everyone now knows, I've been at the Post for a very long time. Um, you know, during the, during the um, Clinton administration and even before, where it, the crisis would rise and everyone would get all excited and scared, and then it goes away. Um, I, this time, I think, is a bit different, though. It's different in, in a number of ways. First of all, you have two leaders who are inexperienced. You have... You have um, um, obviously, uh, Kim Jong-un, who, who is very young, 33 years old, uh, came to power uh, after a very sheltered upbringing and seemed to feel that his way of consolidating his power was to basically do away with, in a very violent way, anyone who he felt was a threat. Um, and you have Donald Trump, who uh, has come into office with no political experience, no real foreign policy experience, and both of them, in addition to being inexperienced, are, um, how shall we say this? They're, they're, they're guys who uh, are very self-confident, um, believe in their own gut feelings, and that's something that can be dangerous uh, in a situation like this. You have two countries that basically don't understand anything about each other. I think that... Um, Although U.S. intelligence spends a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what's going on in North Korea and parsing out uh, every press release and, and literally taking apart every, every pixel of every picture that comes out of there to see what they can figure out about it, they actually don't know very much about, about how the place works and what the leader means when he says things. Is he trying to be provocative? Is he actually threatening? Um, what are his intentions? And similarly, I think they don't know that about us either. And I think that the past several months with the new administration has only compounded that confusion on their part. Uh, they see the Secretary of State gets up one day and says, we have no intention of uh, regime change. We do not want to change the government. We will not invade. Uh, we don't want to press for reunification. Um, and then you have the president gets up and says locked and loaded and fire and fury. And so I think they don't know how to interpret that. Um, all of that together with the actual real gains that we've seen uh, out of North Korea in terms of their nuclear program, I think is kind of a, has heightened the, the risk of this being a real crisis as opposed to the kind of cyclical um, crises that we've, that we've gone through before. 
I don't think anybody actually wants to have a war, but I think that the room for misunderstanding and for um, taking an action that is misunderstood by the other side and provokes a reaction that nobody really intended is much, much greater uh, than it used to be. Um, having said all that, do I know what's going to happen? No, I don't have a clue. I mean, I think that um, the administration, ha having held out a relative olive branch and said, we want to talk, now this week has said, well, actually, we don't think this is a good time to talk. Not that there had been any response from the North Koreans. Uh, there's a proposal for this joint freeze where they would freeze their nuclear and ballistic missile programs in exchange for us freezing our um, military exercises. Uh, Russia and China have said they think this is a good idea. The administration has said absolutely not. Um, I think there, there will be another round of sanctions. Um, it will start to um, affect oil shipments. It will start to have secondary effects on, on the banking system and on people who trade with North Korea. A lot of attention has been focused on China, and certainly China is, is uh, North Korea's lifeline. But I think it will be interesting to look at what Russia does, because you saw Russia this week say, you know, we don't think there should be other sanctions. Um, you, a lot of the smuggling now of, of energy, certainly energy, but other things too, is, is coming not from China, but from Russia. And so the question is how, one question, how the, the kind of renewed rivalry and, and bad relations between the United States and Russia will play into this, um, where, where you have the two sides kind of competing for um, being the tough guy uh, in the world, even as they say they want to make things better between them. So having said all that, I think there will be additional sanctions. Um, the question, as it always is, is how strongly they'll be obeyed and whether they will do any good. I, I think there's actually a very interesting piece in, in next week's New Yorker, I think, that, that um, Evan Osnos has written. Um, about after a trip to Pyongyang. And everybody he talked to said, um, um, you know, we've been through wars. We've been under threat. We can do it again. You know, it's not, a, not that big a deal. And I think that from a leadership um, point of view, they uh, feel like if it comes to that, you know, so be it. In, in a way, it's sort of, puts them on an equal footing in their, in their minds. And again, that's what makes this a particularly dangerous situation. So again, more sanctions, see if it works, um, see if the North Koreans will back down. Uh, there's no real sign that they will at the moment. Sanctions are what we always turn to when we don't want a war, but right. we do want something to change. Right. Can you think of examples in the last 20 years where sanctions have brought about something that the U.S. thought was critical to achieve? Iran. Iran. I think, no. I think you can argue that sanctions worked. Um, a lot of pressure was put on Iran. Um, they saw a way out. Uh, in exchange for a price, it was a price that they negotiated over and thought was worth paying for what they got out of it. So I think, yeah, I yeah. think it made a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And it was banking sanctions, it was trade, it was everything across the board. So. Yeah. And there was a lot of cheating, as there always is. And uh, there were a lot of exceptions made. But I think, by and large, they could see that it was holding them back. Um, because, I mean, they're, they're different than, than North Korea, for mm -hmm. one thing. Um, you know, they, they see themselves as part of the wider world, um, and, and I think they could see how this was keeping them from, from doing that, regardless of what their geopolitical ambitions are uh, and, their, and their military ambitions and their, and their rivalries are. I mean, they, economically, they saw right. themselves as part of the world. Right, right. Now, you mentioned Russia, Karen, <laughs> in the context of 
the Korean crisis. And that just underscores something that I did want to ask you about, which is the sense that Russia is kind of in the middle of everything these days. It's in the middle of our own elections. It's in the middle of the situation in the Middle East. It's, it's got, a, got a role to play in Korea. It's got a role to play with Iran. Um, how do you see U.S.-Russia relations these days with diplomats packing their suitcases on both sides um, and a whole veil of tension and criticism back and forth? How is this similar to the Washington-Moscow relations during the Cold War, and how is it different? I don't think it's too similar to the way it was during, during the Cold War. Um, First of all, I think, I think the Russians are quite happy to be the center of mm -hmm. attention. I mean, I think that that plays into to what, what the way Putin sees um, Russia's, Russia's role in the world. And I also think that um, they are cooperating in some areas. I mean, they're certainly cooperating in Syria. There's no question about that. Not only in the ceasefire that they've negotiated in one relatively small and relatively inconsequential part of the country. But also in, um, you know, you, you, you saw uh, the Syrian military take over uh, the, the city of Deir ez um, this week, which has been surrounded by, by the Islamic State for years. Um, it was no accident that the, that the um, coalition allowed them to go in and do it. That was part of the deal. Um, and they did make a deal. You know, they drew lines on a map and they said, okay, you don't go any farther than this and you don't bother us and we won't bother you. Um, I think that that's, it's a, uh, that's a sort of tactical um, situation that suits both of their purposes. And even when the Russians said after the, um, after the f initial expulsions, uh, at the end of the Obama administration, that's it, we're not gonna talk to you anymore. They've been talking the whole time. And they still say they're not talking, but they are talking. Um, so on those kinds of specific issues, I think they're talking a lot. Um, and they are actually getting things done. On the larger questions of, of um, you know, provocations um, in, in, in the Baltic, um, in, um, on North Korea being problematic on North Korea, and obviously they voted for the last sanctions resolution. They've said they're not interested in the next one, but who knows what, what will happen when it actually comes to that and, and the text of it's still being negotiated. So uh, again, I think, I think the Russians, the, the Russians are, are sort of schizophrenic about this. They, they like being the center of attention. They like people being afraid of them. Um, they don't like not having, uh, uh, being included in the in the international councils, they don't like not being part of the G7 to make it the G8 again. Um, they don't like being excluded uh, to the extent they're being excluded from NATO. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, to the extent that they can move these conversations and agreements from these sort of tactical talks to, to larger questions where they do see room to cooperate, then that's, everybody thinks that's all to the good, and I, and I think it is. Um, the, the wild card is, is, of course, the investigations here and the extent to which that becomes um, something that uh, the Russians have to answer for, although it must be said that they haven't had to answer for it really at all so far. They've just so, denied that they, they had just, anything to do. Yeah, and, and um, I don't know if, um, I, I think their hopes of having better relations, what they would see as better relations with this country um, under the Trump administration are, have pretty much been thrown to the wind now. And, and you know, you saw Putin and Lavrov and everybody kind of making excuses for Trump uh, for a long time saying, oh, you know, that place is crazy and the Congress is crazy and they're just not, getting on with the president's agenda, uh, they don't say that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I, think that they, I think that they feel like the, the playing field is a bit different than, than what they thought it was. Right, right. So that touches on the next area I wanted to ask you about, which was sort of looking at the whole horizon um, of international relations and international policy. 
Do you see anything in this time when so much seems to be upended? Do you see things where you say to yourself, I never thought I would see fill in the blanks? Um, is there something that you're seeing these days that is just, just something you never thought you would see during your career as a national security correspondent? Well, you know, there's a lot going on and a lot has changed. Um, is it something that no one could have predicted? I, I don't know. Uh, that I would have not predicted? I, I don't know. I mean, you, you look at the Middle East and you look at what has happened there since the Arab Spring and the new kind of, if not border lines, certainly political lines and relationship lines that are, that are being drawn and, and still has a long way to go before it before it sorts itself mm -hmm. out. Um, I think that that that's, is a major change um, in the world. I think Latin America, where I pretty much started out working, um, where you see, uh, when, when I started working there, was one of the first jobs I had at the Post. And I know Jim Hoagland, who was my boss, is here tonight. So I have to be careful. <laughs> uh, um, you know, there was one country uh, that, that didn't have a military government. Um, now, you can argue about Cuba and you can argue about uh, Nicaragua and, and, and you can argue certainly a lot about Venezuela. But, you know, you see these, these democracies and people who really care about it. And certainly they have problems and, uh, you know, the situation there kind of ebbs and flows. But, but you see really them sticking up for democracy really almost more than this government is right now. Um, and um, it's funny to look at, and I'm switching the subject because I can't think of a good answer to your question, but, but um, you know, you, you look at this administration and you see that the kind of obligatory bows to democracy and human rights and, and, and things that, that administrations of both parties have, have made part of their rhetoric, at least, and, and often part of their policy, it doesn't come up that much now. But at the same time, you see things happening um, that show that it's, it, it's harder to get out of it than, than they might intend. I mean, you saw, you saw a big um, uh, suspension of aid to Egypt um, this month. What, who, would, who would have thought? Um, that, and, and they said it was on human rights grounds. I mean, it's just unheard of. And yet you would never hear that come from the president. So there is this machinery of government that kind of carries on underneath this layer of, of, uh, of drama um, uh, that I think allows it, allows it to continue. Yeah, yeah, great. Karen, let's turn for a few minutes to the media itself. Um, and when I think about the media sector that these journalists that have been with us for the last six months is gonna be, they're gonna be um, pursuing their careers in a sector that's gone through a lot of changes. Um, but I wanna start with a question that is more or less about what hasn't changed, um, about really the basics that you would hope that these these, these talented journalists with us tonight um, would always have. And I wonder if you have three or four key pieces of advice for them with respect to the basics of great reporting, of developing sources, of sticking with stories, of determining what the next set of questions is every time you wake up. Well, we. You and I talked, talked a little bit about this before. I think um, one thing that's, that's difficult right now is the churn of events is so fast and, and often so unexpected that you find yourself, I find myself at least, um, doing the news story every day, every day, every day and looking at the next sort of turn uh, in, in a way that gives you very little time to sit and say, well, wait a minute, what's really going on here? And what's, what should I be writing about other than the latest sort of outrage or surprising thing? Or, um, so I think that it's, 
uh, and, and we even have the luxury of, of having a big newspaper and a lot of people um, that um, can allow us to, to have people have the time to step back and, and, and ask those kinds of questions. But it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of balancing act because if you don't, if you're not doing that kind of daily reporting where you're out there and people are reading you and people are saying, oh, here's a person who actually knows what's going on. Here's a person who um, knows the players, who understands. Then I think you have a problem with the, the other thing you referred to, which, which is building a source network. Um, you, you, as all of you know, all of you who are in the business, I mean, you, you build sources by having credibility, by, to some extent, having something to give in order to get something, um, by uh, having somebody recognize your name and know your work and to say, this, I'll talk to this person because, number one, this person's not going to screw me. It's not going to burn me. And number two, they actually know what they're talking about, so I'm not wasting my time. And they might have an interesting question, and um, they might uh, actually tell me something. Um, you know, and people, people talk to you for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's sort of self-aggrandizement, and, and they think they're the only person who knows, so they're glad you called them. But, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that's so important. And, and it was so interesting with this administration. I think they came in. And we had a lot of people who knew them politically because of the campaign, um, but didn't know me, for example, didn't know the people who dealt with foreign policy and national security, basically because there wasn't hardly, there were hardly any of them. Um, and, and obviously, the sort of first round of people kind of got ousted. Uh, um, and, um, but, but what I found is that, um, you know, you, you can get to know those people. And there are a lot of smart people there. Uh, they're not always the people who are making the decisions, and sometimes their decisions are being overruled or sidetracked because the president or somebody else comes out and says something that's not in line with what everybody thought the policy was. Um, but it's, and sometimes it's a little bit more work. But, but um, you, you sometimes you, you have to just make yourself um, uh, reach out to people and not jump to the conclusion that seems really obvious about what's what's going on with these folks. Um, often th that's the correct conclusion, but but um, it's it's I've just found it such an interesting process. It's always interesting at the beginning of admi an administration, and and sometimes frustrating because you have to start all over again in some senses. Although there is the the, the kind of Mandarin class that's still that's still there, but. Um, so I think that um, uh, you know, keeping in touch with the news and not saying, "Oh no, I'm, I don't have to do you know the kind of daily grunt work because I do the big picture." Um, you have to guard against that. I think you know, building sources is so important. I think mastering the the technology. I mean, everybody knows that that's. Um, something that somebody my age finds difficult. Um, but you've got hundreds of tweets, wonderful <laughs> tweets that you could, I mean, as many as the president, I think. Uh, a lot of, no, <laughs> no, not as many. They're not, they're as not many. nearly as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, so. and was it difficult to become comfortable with that and other forms of? It's still difficult. It's yeah. still difficult for me. Not, I, I, it's not that. Technology is difficult, but I find it a distraction. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, I know that P I, I was on Trump's trip to, um, the first trip he took, the big long trip overseas. And I was with one of my colleagues, Phil Rucker, who's our chief White House correspondent, who's just terrific. Uh, but he's tweeting out there all day, you know, he's sending stuff out. And I'm, what are you saying? Um, <laughs> and I find myself, not only uncomfortable saying something uh, before I've had the time to make you know the obligatory 20 phone calls and, and do all this stuff um, and and think about how I want to 
uh, organize a story. But I also, I, I just, I find it distracting and I have to make myself want to do it because there's a lot of pressure, uh, not only in our newsroom, but all over the place uh, to do this because believe me, people keep track, you know. <laughs> In the, in the new Washington Post newsroom that we moved into about a year and a half ago, there's a place that they call The Hub, which is this huge kind of starship enterprise place. And it's, go, it's, has, it's a big atrium, and it's the same at the New York Times. And, you know, it's several stories high, and it has big boards on there, and the clicks are, you know, you see them, their numbers turning over all the time. And I, somebody's looking at them and understands it. I don't, but, um, you know, they, it's a new part of your job and you have to do it. It's new to me. It's probably, you guys are lucky because you're, um, it's not new to you. I mean, it's part of your life um, and it's, it's part of how, what you came up with. So that's, you know, I started as a foreign correspondent worrying about um, where I was going to get enough paper to put in my typewriter. <laughs> um, so, as I, you know, in Africa or Asia or someplace like that. So um, it's, just, it's just different. Right, um, it is different. I yes. remember arriving at the Wall Street <laughs> Journal in New York and they said, do you want a manual typewriter or an electric one? <laughs> that I shouldn't deserve an electric right, one. I'll just right. take a manual. That'll be fine. Well, this yeah. was literally on the road. You know, you had your little Olivetti in the yeah. case and you'd sit Not down. Not so little. And, and really I had heavy. this terrible habit of now, you know, on a computer, you write a lead and you don't like it. You just get rid of it. Um, then you put a piece of paper in and then you had to think whether you wanted to rip the paper up and throw it on the floor or turn it over and use the other side. Because right. you had to carry all of this stuff around with you. And it was so time. satisfying to ball it up and throw it on the floor and start over again. Yeah. So the next yeah. questions are gonna come from our fellows. Great. So they're about to return and this is maybe the last input of, <clears throat> of, of knowledge and mentoring they get before they go back home to their I, I just want to say one thing first. I mean, I, this yeah. is going to sound very corny, but I, I, you know, you guys come here and you're learning things from us. I, I wish we had a program that went in the other direction, mm -hmm. um, that we would go and sit, um, you know, in, a, in an actual newsroom in India or in Pakistan or in, in Cuba or, or in Ukraine and, and try to understand, because people like me are writing about your countries all the time and we come in and out and Sometimes we actually live there for a while. But um, I, one of the things I said to Tim the other day was that many of us would find it very difficult to do our jobs if it weren't for local journalists uh, in, in the countries we cover. Um, oftentimes there are people who cannot uh, report what they know, um, either because it's politically unpopular or it's really dangerous. Uh, um, and those are the people who are enormously helpful to us. Um, and again, I think that we would find it hard to do what we do if, if people were not available on the ground there who spoke the same journalistic language that we did and were not willing to help us. So yeah. that's, Good. that's Good. my thank you to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, Karen, hi. My name is Nicholas Chang. Uh, I'm a Daniel Pearl Fellow, and I have been training with the uh, Alfred Friendly Program. Before I came to the U.S., uh, I was covering the assassination of Kim Jong-nam in my country, uh, so North Korean connection over there. And uh, after I'm done with this fellowship, I'm actually going to the London School of Economics to study terrorism. So uh, national security is a big interest for me. Uh, I want to bring uh, the questioning back to North Korea. What I've been really curious about in this whole hullabaloo of, oh my god, they have a nuclear weapon that can reach New York or Boston, there seems to be uh, an area that people are not too concerned about, which I think that they should be, which is what CNN is calling Trump's Cold War on the intelligence community. Um, it's something that I think isn't getting much play in the media, um, and I think that's a big concern. I'm just wondering um, you know, what your opinion is on what the intelligence community can do um, to stop the president from contributing to this misunderstanding that you were talking about that could lead to conflict because um, they are risking their lives to bring information to advise the White House on what to do and it seems their biggest uh, uh, roadblock is in the White House. I, I think it's a big problem. Um, and we've written some about it and others have written some about it. 
um, I think that it, it exists on several levels. You have, you have a new CIA director who um, is very politically involved um, with the White House, he came from Congress, um, and uh, where he was pretty outspoken on a number of things that didn't necessarily comport with what the, what the intelligence community was telling the then White House. Um, you have a president who, during the campaign, compared intelligence officers to Nazis, um, you know, and had various other bad things to say about him. You have a conviction in the White House that the intelligence community is leaking like mad, which I think is less than they would like you to believe. And they, they've, they've done a very good job of trying to conflate um, gossip about what's going on in the White House with actual national security leaks. And so when you see the president tweet out about you know, these terrible leaks and we're going to get to the bottom of the leaks, if you actually look at the leaks that they're talking about, they're not national security leaks at all, or by and large they're not. The vast majority of them are not. They're things about who's ratting on whom in the political sphere um, you know, around, around the president. So that being said, I, I, I do think that a lot of people in the intelligence community are not happy. Um, they feel like they're disrespected. They feel like um, uh, they are not listened to. Um, when what they have to say does not comport with what the political views um, in the White House and some people in Congress are. I think it's gotten a little bit better uh, in the White House terms since General Kelly took over as the chief of staff um, and, and General McMaster. Um, and the fact that there are so many generals, that's another whole thing we could talk about. But I think that... Um, it, not only did they take over, but there were a lot of people in the National Security Council who were there because they subscribed to certain views, particularly about Iran, uh, about the Middle East, about North Korea, and those people gradually are, are kind of going away. Um, so I think that's, that's good. Um, and that was a source of real conflict, um, especially with, with the, the CIA. Um, so I think, again, I think it's not a good situation. Um, it's getting a little bit better. Um, I don't think, in terms of the, of the CIA director, I don't think it's that people don't like him. They just don't feel very close to him and they're suspicious of his political motivations and they really pride themselves on being apolitical. So I think it's a, I think it's a problem. And it'll be great to, to, for you to work on it and look at, at how it affects counterterrorism policy. Um, it's also that you know that the that the president is so uh, leans so heavily toward the military as opposed to the the um, and at, in the view of many at the expense of the intelligence community. Yeah. Another question. Smitha. Hi, I'm Smita. I'm a Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman fellow with the Ultra Friendly Program. Uh, I'm asking you this question because this is something I have read in editorials in Indian newspapers. Uh, the, that's also the impression that I get, and I would like to know it in the context of North Korea. To me, it seems that the U.S. for the first time seems to have no clue about its foreign policy. <clears throat> Do you as a national security person, you know, someone who has covered it for so long, feel that, is that the case, that you have no, no idea how to deal with North Korea perhaps for the first time? Well, that would, that would imply that, that the previous administrations had good ideas about how to deal with North Korea, and I don't think they really did. Um, I, you know, you can go back, you go back to the Clinton administration, you know, they, um, Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State, went to Pyongyang, and they, um, I think, they, they, they basically sort of ran out of time uh, to do a deal, and maybe they would have done a deal. Um, the Bush administration came in and said, uh, absolutely, we're not going to talk to these people. Then they kind of changed their mind and said, oh, we're going to talk to them. Um, but I, but I, think that, I don't think any administration has had a really good idea of how to deal with them, largely because they're just not responsive um, to what we think are the normal, you know, kind of, I hate to say this, deal-making of, uh, of foreign policy. But, um, you know, I think the administration, again, I. 
you've got a you've got a Secretary of State who's a smart guy and has a lot, has a lot of experience in the world, although not in diplomacy, um, who has you know morale at the at the State Department's terrible. You've got a lot of jobs that are not filled, and even though a lot of people agree that they need to have a reorganization, and there's a lot of um, a lot of jobs that don't need to be filled, and a lot of changes that need to be made, they're not being made fast enough, and so they don't feel that the State Department, their own expert, what they would think of as their own expertise, is not being given as big enough a voice. The president's contradicting the Secretary of State. The um, you know the the uh, defense secretary is making foreign policy. Um, I don't think that the I don't think that the president has what you would call a foreign policy. I don't think he came in with a lot of ideas um, other than American foreign policy should exist to serve the interests of the United States. Um, you know, ever thus. It's always been true, but other people have gone about it a different way and had different ideas about what actually served American foreign policy. Right now, this president looks at it as buying our weapons, um, investing in the United States, um, um, having a, giving us a favorable trade balance with them. Um, all, all of those flow from the idea that we have to look out for ourselves first, and that's very different, I think, than what you've seen of American foreign policy um, for decades. Uh, how that's going to play out, I, I don't know. I mean, there is this underlayer of professionals who, you know, have experience and have a memory of how it's supposed to work. Um, and, and you see that resurfacing from time to time. But the question is, is when you've, you know, if you've got the Germans mad at you and you've got the French mad at you and you don't know what you're doing with the Russians, it's just there are too many things at once that are unsettled, mm -hmm. I think. And that always gives a lot of room for, for error. And, and, and it becomes a question of, is there enough time for people to figure this out? Mm -hmm. Whether or not you agree with the direction they want to go in for them to figure out actually what that direction is. Yeah. I think there's one more question from Ukraine. Uh, yeah, good evening, uh, current team. I am Yuliana Romaneshin. I am an Alfred Press Partners Fellow from Ukraine. I'm working back home at the, one of the sole source of English news called Cave Post, my newspaper. Uh, a lot of people here keep asking me, so what, are, what is our opinion, Ukrainians' opinion, about Russian and American relations? I don't have an answer. Uh, my question would be uh, like that, how do you think... I do have an answer. <laughs> it's rather, do you think, is there any negotiations, internal negotiations between Trump and Putin? Because we have a lot of thoughts about Germany and Russia, and that's why I'm asking about that. Do you think, is there any any internal things, we, we are probably might be not aware of that. But what is your opinion about that? Um, I may you. be wrong, but I don't think so. I think at a lot of levels, there are talks going on all the time, at a military level, at a diplomatic level, uh, at, at various levels in each of those spheres. Between the White House and, and the Kremlin, I don't think so. Um, I, I may be totally wrong, but I, I, I think that that's, you know, that that is, in large part because of the legal situation, that they don't want to be, um, they don't want to add to their problems. The administration doesn't. And, and I think that they've been advised not to do it, um, not to have those kinds of, talk. I mean, you know, you did have, you saw the uproar when President Trump at the, at the G20 dinner walked over and sat down and, and talked, to, talked to Putin after they had their formal talks. Um, you know, and, and even um, Republicans in Congress saying, what is this about, you know, what? And so I think that, I don't think that, there, that there's, at that level, I mean, you know, will they talk to each other at the UN General Assembly? I don't know, but I don't think there's any sort of secret White House Kremlin stuff going on. I, who knows if it's secret, but maybe I don't know, but I don't think so. Great. Karen, you've been hugely generous with your oh, insights and you. ideas and just your presence here. So many thanks. Thank you all.